Well, there's a, employment discrimination. Employment discrimination against those labeled felons is perfectly legal and absolutely routine. In one survey, about 70% of employers said they wouldn't ever consider hiring someone who was convicted of a drug felony. Now, never mind that most Americans have violated drug laws in their lifetime, but if you've been caught, if you have that you know, felony, drug felony on your record, 70% uh, of employers are going to throw that application straight in the trash without even reading it. Um, and virtually every job application has that box you got to check. You know, have you ever been convicted of a felony? And it doesn't matter if that felony happened three weeks ago or 35 years ago. For the rest of your life, you are expected to check that box. I'm a felon, automatically excluding you from consideration from most employment. Housing discrimination, perfectly legal. In fact, you are barred from public housing for a minimum of five years when you're released from prison. Now, what do we expect folks to do? Federal regulations actually encourage public housing agencies to discriminate against people with criminal records for the rest of their lives. So here you are, released from prison, no job, no cash, nowhere to sleep. In fact, if your family lives in public housing, they risk eviction if they let you come stay with them. So your son is released from prison, wants to, I want to come home, mom. You're living in public housing, you have perhaps other young children, you risk eviction, homelessness, and putting your family on the street if you let your son come home to stay with you. Private landlords and public housing agencies routinely discriminate against people with criminal records. Discrimination perfectly legal in public benefits. In fact, if you have a drug felony, you are deemed ineligible for food stamps for the rest of your life. Pregnant women, people with HIV, AIDS, it doesn't matter how hungry you are, how sick you are, how poor you are, no food. Not even going to give you food to survive. What do we expect folks to do? Can't get a job. You got no place to sleep. Growing number of homeless shelters screened for criminal convictions. Can't even get food stamps. What do we expect folks to do? Well, what we expect them to do is pay hundreds or thousands of dollars in fees, fines, court costs, accumulated back child support, and in a growing number of states, you're expected to pay back the cost of your imprisonment. And then get this, you're one of the lucky few who actually managed to get a job, up to 100% of your wages can be garnished to pay back all those fees, fines, court costs, accumulated back child support, cost of your imprisonment. 100% of your wages can be garnished. What do we expect folks to do? You know, I say, what is the system designed to do? I think it seems clearly designed to send people right back to prison which is what, in fact, happens about 70% of the time. 70% of those released from prison return within three years, and the majority of those who return do so in a matter of months because the challenges associated with just survival on the outside are so immense. Now, many people have told me who have been formerly incarcerated that as bad as all that is, <laughs> as bad as all of the forms of legal discrimination and exclusion are that it's not even the worst of it. That the worst of it is the stigma. The stigma that follows you for the rest of your life. That stigma and shame. I'm a felon. I'm a felon. That stigma and shame associated with criminality is what causes so many people to try to pass. You know, during the Jim Crow era, light-skinned blacks would try to pass as white to avoid the shame and stigma of race. Well, today, those labeled criminals, those branded felons, try to pass not just by lying on employment applications or to housing officials, but by lying to their friends, their neighbors, their coworkers. The shame and stigma associated with criminality is such that people are afraid to talk to one another, they say, yeah, 
yeah, I, I haven't seen Tony around in a while. I'm not sure where he is. Or, yeah, my uncle, he's been gone for a while. He'll be back. Where's my son? He's probably staying with his daddy. I think he's going to be back in about six months. The shame keeps people quiet, keeps people lying and denying to each other about what is happening in our communities and in our family. In fact, there was an excellent ethnographic study done in Washington, D.C. of neighborhoods hardest hit by mass incarceration. I mean, these are neighborhoods where every house or every other house or apartment either has somebody who's currently behind bars, has a family member who's currently behind bars, or somebody who's just recently returned home from prison. I mean, these are neighborhoods where so many people have spent time in prison, you would think that everybody would just be talking about it. It would just be topic of conversation every day. But in this study, they couldn't find a single person in these neighborhoods, not one, who had fully come out to their friends, neighbors, or loved ones about their own criminal history or that of their loved ones. There was still such shame and stigma that people tried to avoid talking about it, denying or lying. And this shame has created a silence that is a bar to collective political action. So what are we going to do? Now, I, I devote the last chapter of the book to exploring the question of you know, where do we go from here? Um, what can be done to dismantle this new system of control? You know, what I firmly believe is that we in the civil rights community We've allowed a human rights nightmare to occur on our watch. You know, while many of us who have been, you know, fighting for to save affirmative action and to cling to the, you know, gains of the civil rights era, millions of people have been rounded up, branded felons, and then released into a permanent undercast. And many of us have barely whispered a word of protest. What is needed, I think, is a broad-based social movement. Nothing short of a broad-based social movement has any hope of ending mass incarceration in America. We're not going to go from the rate of incarceration we have today to the one we even had in the bad old days of the 1970s without a major fight. We're not going to release four out of five people from prison and welcome them home with open arms and grant them jobs and housing without a drastic shift in our public consciousness. It's going to require a major shift in our orientation towards poor folks of color. The punitive impulse that has swept this nation will have to be transformed into a wave of care, compassion, and concern for all those who have been locked up, locked out, or left behind. And many people, I find, get kind of overwhelmed when you start talking about social movements. You know, people say, build a social movement? How, how are we going to build a social movement? You know, or other people will tell me, well, social movement, that kind of sounds like a 1960s sort of thing, you know. This is, you know, we're not in the 60s anymore. How are we going to build a social movement? But other groups in the United States are building movements as we speak. You know, the Tea Party movement is functioning very well in the United States today, and it is a grassroots movement that is well organized and has been gathering steam for some time. Um, there's a gay rights movement in the United States. There are movements in the United States challenging the status quo and the dominant framing of, of justice and rights in America. But folks of color, poor folks of color, and their allies, we've been largely silent and largely passive. So we have got to begin to speak up and speak out and get organized. And the first step, I believe, is for us to begin telling the truth courageously about how this system 
came to be, how it functions, and the damage it is doing in poor communities of color today.